Welcome to lecture 8.4, Basic Concepts of Probability. Yes, this was uh, my first professorial outfit at the age of five. I don't still own a bow tie, but maybe I should get one as a professor. Anyway, today we're going to look at how do we calculate probability on more complex events or multiple events at the same time, like if, if A or B happens, for example. So if we tossed a fair die with six sides, we have the sample space, one, two, three, four, five, six. We know this from before. If event E was to roll an even number, that's pretty much easy to find the um, outcomes for E, which are two, four, six. And if event F was to roll a number greater than four, this would just be five and six, um, we might want to figure out what is the probability of roll of event E or F happening. One of the ways to, to see this easier is if we represent the sets with Venn diagrams. These are circles or ovals that are drawn to represent where membership is. Okay, so everything we're looking at event E, which is an even roll, and remember that includes two, four, and six, the even numbers in the sample space. And event F was a roll greater than four. This just includes five and six in the sample space. And we can see that um, six is indeed part of both of them. And that's why it's where these two ovals or events overlap. So what's interesting is in set concepts, <clears throat> if we want to count the number of outcomes in um, E or F, in E or F, this is the number in E, which is 3, plus the number in F, which is 2, minus the number in both, which is 1. Now, why do we do that? Because if we don't do that, we're going to double count, we're going to double count the 6, even though it's included in both. And that's what we're avoiding here, is double counting um, any members that are in the intersection, okay? So by our probability definition, remember probability is the number of, of outcomes in an event divided by um, the number of outcomes in the sample space. Um, so we can do that pretty simply, okay? So let's look at this. <clears throat> the probability of E, there's three in E and there's six possible. The probability of F, there's two answers in F out of six possible in the sample space minus what's in E and F, which is one member um, out of six out of the... Uh, and so our probability of rolling either a um, even number or a number greater than four is um, four out of six or two thirds, okay? This is a really, really important formula for you to remember when we're trying to figure out if um, the probability of two events, um, if one event or another event occurs. Okay, if one event or another event occurs, and that or is really important, um, not and, that's the intersection, but or. The probability of E and F happening is simply one out of six, because there's only one member that's in E and F, and that's the number six, the outcome six, and that's one outcome out of six potential, okay? In words, the probability of E or F equals the probability of E plus the probability of F minus the probability of E and F. Remember, and is intersection. And is intersection. <clears throat> Find the probability that a marble lands on red or an even number or an even number. And that's um, the event is E. All right, so we first need to understand a roulette table. OK, in American roulette, there's 38 slots and it's not symmetrical. So you need to know this. All right. The slots are numbered one through 36. There's an, there's two other numbers. There's a zero and a double zero. Zero and double zero are green. And these are not considered even or odd. Zero and double zero are green and not even or odd. 18 slots are black. 
with 10 of them being even and 8 of the numbers being odd. 18 slots are red with 10 being odd and 8 even. So the way I remember this is red ends in D and has more odd spots. Okay? Red ends in D and has more odd spots, which also ends in D. All right. So what we need is the probability of red plus the probability of even minus the probability of even and red. Okay? The probability of, of red or even is equal to the probability of red plus the probability of even minus the probability of even and red. Well, what, how many? There are 38 possible outcomes. That's our sample space, right? How many um, slots are red? 18. So here we have 18 out of 38. Probability of even. How many numbers are even? Well, between 1 and 36, half of those numbers are even, so we have 18. So 18 out of 38 minus the probability of even and red. Well, how many of the red slots are even? Eight. So we minus eight out of 38. Okay. There are 18 red slots. So 18 out of 38. There are 18 even numbers because there are numbers zero to 36. Or excuse me, one to 36. And there are eight red and even numbers, as we can see there. And so our probability is 28 out of 38. Again, it's very important that you remember this fundamental formula. The probability of one event or another event happening is the probability of each event added together minus the probability of the, any members in their intersection. Two fair die are rolled. What is the probability the first die is a two or the sum of the two dice is a six or seven? This one's a little bit more complicated, but again, the probability that the first die is a two, okay, well, how many possible rolls are there in one die? There's um, six, right? So the probability that the first die is a two um, is 1 out of 6, okay? Probability that the sum is a 6 or 7, this is a little more confusing because we have to think in terms of the combination of two different die, okay? So notice here what we've got is a kind of a diagram of all of the outcomes possible that the first die is a 1 and the second die is a 1. The first die is a 4 and the second die rolls a 4. The first die rolls a 3, and the second die rolls a 5. So there's actually 36 possible outcomes here, okay? The kind of orangish-red um, bar across tells us um, event T, that the first die rolls a 2, okay? What you see in this blue diagonal are all of the sums that add up to 6 or 7. So sometimes listing out... Um, the possible outcomes can help you kind of sort through them mentally as well, okay? So we, we need the probability of 2, which is 1 out of 6 out of 36, or 1 out of 6. It's probably easier to put it out of these whole ones. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 out of 36 possibles. So this would be 6 out of 36. Now, why do I say to do that instead of putting 1, 6? Because... The rest of these will have the same sample space denominator, and it's easier when you have a common denominator, you just add and subtract the numerators. The probability that the sum um, is a 6 or 7 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 out of 36. And the probability that the sum is of 6 or 7 and the first die is 2 is where these overlap, and so that's just 2 out of 36. And you can see all of those numbers there. So our probability is 15 out of 36. So why don't you look at that chart and see if you can do this second problem, um, excuse me, by, um, by pausing the video and then doing it and see what you get the answer. So what is the probability that the sum is 11? Well, there can't be too many 11s in here, right? I think there's only two. 
um, 5 and 6 and 6 and 5. Nothing else adds up to 11. These add up to 10. These add up to 9, etc. Okay, so there's only two that are 11. And the second die is a 5, which is this um, fifth row here. Okay, and so we can see that there's one overlapping. So given that, we have the probability that the second die is a 5 is 6 out of 36. It's this fifth row. Plus the probability that the sum is 11 is just these two on the end, 6 and 5 and 5 and 6, those two rolls out of 36, minus whatever the intersection is, what's in both, and that's just this 5. Actually, it's the other way around, isn't it? The second die is a, a 5, so it should be... La, 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 la. The second die is a 5 would be this column, this column. All right? All right. And we can see that this is the one that's intersecting 1 out of 36. <clears throat> Let's continue on. <clears throat> if events E and F are disjoint, that they don't have anything intersecting, then the probability of E or F is simply the sum of their probabilities. Well, this, of course, makes sense because if they didn't have anything in common, then the probability of E and F would be zero. So it's really the same formula, just knowing that the probability of E and F for um, disjoint events is zero. The addition rule for disjoint events can help us solve some problems too by restating the problem into an OR statement. If a couple has three ch children, what's the probability that at least two are girls? Now, it's really important when you're figuring out probabilities that you're very exact. So the couple has three children. What's the probability that at least two are girls? At least, at most, is not exact. How many girls are we talking about if we're talking about at least two girls? Well, we're talking that there are two girls or three girls. So what we're really trying to figure out is that the probability that there are two or three girls. So these are, we can do that kind of probability. <clears throat> so we're looking for the probability that the family has exactly two or three girls. We look at this and we're looking for any of the probability of two plus the probability of three minus the probability of two intersecting three. The probability of two is, let's see, two, two girls is one, two, three out of eight. The probability of three girls is one out of eight. And the probability of two or three is zero, right? Because there's none with two or and three. There's no intersection. You either have two or three. Okay. And so we get a probability that there's um, that has <clears throat> that there are at least two girls is actually one half. Okay. The complement rule. This goes along with the idea that the probability of all subset events um, is equal to one if you sum them. So if we know that um, the probability of E naught, remember this E apostrophe is E naught, the complement of E, um, then the probability of E plus the probability of E naught would include everything in the sample space. So these would have to add up to one. So if we're given one of these values, we can figure out the other one just by subtracting it from one because they have to add up to one. And sometimes it's a lot easier to solve a problem by finding the opposite, by using this complement rule, and then just subtracting that answer from one. Okay. So here's a good problem. What's the probability that the sum of the roll of two die is greater than three? Well, think about that. That means the sum is equal to 4, the sum is equal to 5, or the sum is equal to 6, or the sum is equal to 7, or 8, or 9, or 10, or 11, or 12, right? So it goes up from 4 to 12. That's a lot of ors in there, and then we have to find any intersecting pieces. <clears throat> But to solve its complement, the sum is less than or equal to 3, you only need the probability of 2 or 3. You can't have a sum equal to 1 when you have 2 die, right? 
If both die roll a 1, you're still going to have a sum of 2. So notice by using this complement rule, we can simplify this problem and not have to do such so many calculations. Okay. Well, the probability that the sum is equal to 2 is only one situation. That's where you, have, you roll both snake eyes, 1 and 1. Right? But the probability of 3, there's two possibilities here. You roll a 1 and a 2 or a 2 and a 3. Again, you cannot roll a 2 and a 3, so there's no overlap or intersection. So we don't, we don't actually add that in here or subtract it, excuse me. And so we get 3 out of 36 or 1 12th. These are probability and odds are often um, confused and, and thought to be the same thing, but they are not the same um, thing for an event, but they are closely related. Okay. The odds in favor of an event are the probability for the event divided by the probability the, uh, against the event. Okay. So what you're going to do here is you're just going to put the probability of an event over the 1 minus that probability and then simplify the fraction. And then you need to state it in words. You know, we don't write odds as fractions. We don't say it's 2 thirds. We say the odds are 2 to 3 or odds are 2 uh, colon 3. Okay, you do not leave odds in fraction form. It's 2 to 3 or 2 colon 3, not 2 over 3. The weatherman said the probability for rain tomorrow is one-third. What are the odds for rain? So the probability for rain goes in the numerator, one-third. Its complement, that it won't rain, goes in the denominator. Well, if one-third is the probability it will rain, one minus one-third is its complement, so we get two-thirds. Okay, now we simply make a fraction, one-third divided by two-thirds. When you have these complex fractions, remember one-third divided by two-thirds is the same as one-third times the reciprocal in the denominator, and this gives us one-half. Odds for rain, and of course we don't leave it as one-half. We write it as one to two, one colon two, or in words, one to two. And you could put one, the number one to the number two here. <clears throat> Often forecasters give probability in terms of percentage. Suppose the weather forecaster says there's a 40% chance that it will snow tomorrow. Find the odds of snow tomorrow. Well, 40% is 40 over 100 or 0.4. This, of course, means the probability it won't snow is 1 minus 40% or 1 minus 0.4 or 0.6. So now it's quite easy to find the odds for snow, which is simply the probability of snow over the probability it won't snow or 0.4 divided by 0.6, which gives us 2 thirds again. And again, we say odds for snow are 2 to 3 or 2 colon 3. We do not um, leave it as that fraction. The odds that are um, <clears throat> that a particular bid will be the low bid are four to five. Find the probability <clears throat> that will be the low bid. Here we're going in the other direction, so we need some new formulas, and here they are. The probability that an event will happen are <clears throat> the M and M. <clears throat> is um, sorry the the are the odds for an event to happen m to n so we put the first number in the numerator and the sum in the denominator <clears throat> since this has a four to five and we're looking that um, this event will happen we put the four in the numerator and the four plus five in the denominator if we were looking that the event would not occur, we'd do the opposite. We'd put the, the second number in the numerator and the sum still in the denominator. Okay, so it's very important that you not only know odds, how to calculate odds by using the probability of an event divided by the probability of the um, complement, but also that you know how to calculate odds, excuse me, calculate probability given specific odds for an event to occur. All right, let's look at something that gets a little more complicated, and we're going to use a Venn diagram for this. 
Let A represent that the driver in a fatal crash was 24 or younger. So already we're getting a little bit confusing here, 24 or younger. So that's less than or equal to 24. And let B represent that the driver had a blood alcohol content of 8.08% or higher. From data on fatal crashes in the year 2010, from the U.S. National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, we have the following probabilities. The probability of A, fatal crash for 24 or younger is 0.2077. The probability of B, this is about blood alcohol content of 0.08 or higher is 0.2180. And the probability of the intersection is 0.0536. So this means that someone was both um, 24 or younger and had a high blood alcohol content. Okay, find that, find that the driver was 25 or older, uh, they're tricky, and had a um, blood alcohol level below 8%. So notice here what we're looking for is the probability that the driver was not A and not B. It was 25 or older, not 24 or younger. And it was the blood alcohol level was below 0.08, so it's not this 0.08 or higher B. Okay. Now, what is not A and not B? What is the intersection of not A and not B? Okay. So if we look at this diagram, we might be able to figure this out. Well, everything that's not A is everything outside the circle of A. Everything that's not B is everything outside the circle of B. Where do they overlap? Well, they overlap in this white area around the two circles, right? Because A is everything outside of itself, and it doesn't include this circle, not A. And not B is everything outside of this circle B and doesn't include it, which is here. So if we're looking for the intersection, it's what is not in the circle A and what is not in the circle B, which is all this white area around the two circles inside the rectangle. Okay. Now, what we want to do is we want to take the data that we were given. You probably just saw it slide down there. But we have to start in the middle. Okay. Because notice this probability of B is the whole circle. The mistake that students often make is just make it this little um, crescent moon shape, but 0.2180 is all of B. So what is this little crescent moon shape? Well, it's 0.2180 minus this little sledge wedge that's in here, 0.0536. Okay. Same thing here with the probability of A. It's 0.2077 minus the 0.0536. I did these backwards. I guess I should have started with A. So the probability of B, which is 0.2180 minus the probability of A and B, which is the 0.0536. Okay. Now, since we know what's inside all three circles, we can add that up. And then to find what's outside of them, we just subtract that number from 1. Remember the complement rule. So the probability of um, A and B, all of this, and then to find the complement, we just subtracted from 1. So we've added those three numbers, subtracted them from 1. So we have a 0.2679 probability that the driver will be 25 or older and um, have a low blood alcohol content. Okay, 0.2679 is our answer here. Let's look at another one. When we do a survey, we can also use the same kind of probability. Data from the 2012 Forbes magazine survey, the 100 highest paid chief executive officers is, is cross-classified by age and years and annual compensation in millions of dollars. Let E be the event the CEO earns less than $25 million and F be the event that the CEO's age is in the 60s, okay? 
So you can see how much they're making here, less than 25, 25 to 35 basically, 35 or more, under 60 in their 60s or 70 and older. Okay. Let event E be the let E be the event that the CEO earns less than 25 million. So that's here. Okay. And F be the event the CEO's age is in the 60s, which is this middle row. All right. So let's find the probability of E, which is the that the um, CEO earns less than 25 million. Well, how many people earn less than 25 million? 28 plus 31 plus 1. Well, that's nice. The table actually gives you that total, 60. Well, what is our sample space? How many people were in this survey? 100. So A is pretty easy to find. It's just 60, the total number that earned less than 25, over the total number that were surveyed. What's the probability of E and F? What's the probability that um, the CEO earns less than 25 and the CEO is in his 60s? Okay. So where is that? So we have the probability that the um, CEO earns less than 25, which is the first column, and then the second row is that they are in their 60s. So we can see that the place that they intersect is right here. And how many did that include? Well, 31. So the probability of, of E and F is simply 31 over 100 or 0.31. So now we've actually set ourselves up. If we want to find the probability of E or F, the probability that a CEO earns less than 25 million or the CEO is in um, their 60s, remember we need to use the formula. The probability of two events, E or F, is the probability of E plus the probability of F minus the probability of E and F. Now we found all of these except for the probability of F, but the probability of F is easy as well because F was the CEOs in their 60s and we can see that there's 45 there, so this would be simply 45 over 100. So we just plug in the values, it's 0.60, probability of E, 0.45 for the probability of F, CEOs in their 60s, minus the duplicate counts, the intersection. And so we get a, a 0.74 um, probability that the CEO is in his 60s or he's earning less than 25.